Are you live? Wonderful. So, uh, my name is Alex Abizaid. I, I am from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm going to be the host for tonight. This symposium is sponsored by Med Alliance. You're going to be able to discuss uh, very interesting new technology on drug eluting balloons. And uh, for that, we have three outstanding speakers representing the United States of America with uh, Ron Watson, South America, Ricardo Costa, and Europe with Florin, that, who is, uh, of course, discuss the newest data on uh, uh, Cirolimus eluting balloon. And uh, I'm sure that you're going to be super excited because there are a lot of points for discussions, including the debate between Cirolimus versus Paclitaxel, the current indications for DCB, bifurcation, small vessels, instant stenosis. So there is a lot for us to learn with these experts. And to help me with the discussion, we're going to have uh, a new Odamonte, who doesn't need in, any introduction. Gaston do Silent from Chile and Marco Weinstein from Brazil. So very eclectic uh, representatives from multiple continents. Um, it's my pleasure to invite my old friend and good friend, Ron Watson, who's been a great supporter for South America, for Solace, for the Brazilian society for so many years. And he runs a very successful course in Washington called CRT. And I was uh, a witness from the very first CRT that he put together. And after more than two decades, you see a huge success. And Ron is the really the point of, uh, of uh, connection uh, between science and practice. So Ron, uh, the word is yours. So you're gonna present the technology. We are all very excited to hear. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, going to try to share my screen and get the slide presentation. It may uh, take some, some reason I cannot share it. So I have to find why this is happening. You don't see the green box or share screen underneath? I do see the share the screen, but for some reason... Um, Maybe I, the technicians put you in a different mode. Yeah, let me just try to see. This is... No, yes. But you see the whiteboard, I don't see my presentation. Yes. Um, which sometimes happens with Zoom. Mm. Try again. If not, we can um, we can have Ricardo, and then you can come back. <clears throat> Just one second. I think we're getting close. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry for the opening glitch, but. Uh, mm -hmm. My friends and colleagues, um, I was actually asked to discuss when and why to use drug eluting balloon and also the importance of sustained limus release. Um, I'll share with you uh, important information, but first, this is uh, my disclosures. I am a consultant also to Med Alliance, which is relevant to this talk. So um, maybe we should takes things in perspective because we're performing intervention nearly 60 years. And uh, before even PCI, there was bypass surgery. After that, uh, Brunsi came, started with Proba, bare metal stand, drug looking stand, first generation, second generation, and then came a drug coated balloon. And initially we had the first generation. And following that, there was the introduction of BBS. And what was common to both of those technologies were that they made the premise of leaving nothing behind. But as of today, we are discussing about a second generation of drug coated balloons. So we're moving again uh, forward. And this is the Limus drug, which uh, I'll try to convince you it's a more effective sustained Limus release 
DS like SLR. So there are a lot of applications for drug coded balloon, and all of them are true also for the solution SLR. Peripheral SFA below the knee. In the coronary, the indication that are most popular, and this is how we started, was instant restenosis, small vessel, and then bifurcation, side branches, lesions. And then there are some indications for arteriovenous fistula with reduction of hemodialysis, shunt restenosis, which is a very devastating for those patients and keeping the dialysis access open longer. And finally, a very interesting uh, application that has been tested or studied in the past with drug looting stand, but I think it's more appealing uh, for drug with a balloon, and this is erectile dysfunction. Uh, the over 300 million men worldwide having uh, ED. And uh, again, it's another interesting indication, and uh, not just to go with proba, but with drug coded balloon or drug eluting balloon. So what is the rationale uh, to use it in coronaries? I think we mentioned leave nothing behind concept. If we could, we would have left no metal in the arteries. And that would allow us to preserve physiological vasomotion, allow the vessel to grow, no caging of the vessel, things that we heard in the past with BBS. But I think drug coded balloon or drug eluting balloon uh, offer the same thing and it's over Come problems associated with the use of the permanent metallic stents, such as jailing of side branches, overhanging osteal lesions, inability to graft the stented segment. Uh, so many drawbacks uh, of the stents can be achieved if we do drug coated balloon and leave nothing behind. And then again, if you need to bypass that vessel, uh, you don't go with a full metal jacket and, and allows grafting by having. Uh, treatment just with drug coated balloon. The absence of any residual foreign material and restoration of functional endothelial coverage can also reduce the risk of stent thrombosis. If we're not going to have a stent, we're not going to have stent thrombosis. And also, we're not going to have any stent allergy. And finally, there is no need for long term dual antiplatelet therapy. So, for all those arguments, we are actually enthused more and more about the potential of drug eluting balloon or DCB. Uh, today I'm going to introduce to you a relatively late comer in the whole drug eluting balloon technology. It is the solution SLR, which stands for sustained limus release, which is uh, manufactured by Medalliance. So first of all, the first question is why serologos? We've been using Paclitaxel until now and results were, I would say, satisfactory and acceptable. But if you look overall and uh, you see on the cell cycle, where is paclitaxel? Paclitaxel is in the M phase and it does give you a relatively short window of therapy. Uh, Sirolimus, however, is cytostatic and it gives you also a immunosuppressive impact and anti-migratory agent that stops the activated small muscle cells to create the restenosis. And it does maintain the cells in the G0 resting phase and limits apoptosis. So overall, it's effective drug, which have been shown uh, immensely on the drug looting. And not only that, it is a safe drug. It does give us a very wide range of safety uh, in respective to the dose. So we are going to have this discussion of Sirolimus versus Paclitaxel. And you can see with respect to toxic effects, they are minimal with serolimus compared to paclitaxel. Uh, and the therapeutic range is also different when you compare between the two. But I pay attention more to the window of therapy and the toxic effects, which are really different between the two. One thing that uh, we have seen uh, is solid clinical evidence based about serolimus and anti-restenotic, the drug of choice. And when you compare studies, and you have a list of studies here, uh, in each of one of them, when the serolimus was compared to paclitaxel, within the drug eluting stand, the late loss was lower, the TLR was lower, it was just simply more effective drug to put on the stand. If that's the case, it probably should be also true on the balloon. And indeed, the serolimus has proven superiority 
over paclitaxel in also large randomized DES trials. And as a result of that, we are not having any more paclitaxel gluting stats. We just have drug gluting stats. But if you compare and contrast between the two, again, the mode of action is different. Sirolimus is cytostatic. Paclitaxel, paclitaxel is cytotoxic. The margin of safety is 10,000 fold versus 100 fold. There is a wide therapeutic range versus narrow therapeutic range. It's both work for antiphoristenosis. Uh, Serolimus also has some anti-inflammatory features and it was accepted completely by the market. Uh, it does have a slow tissue absorption compared to fast tissue absorption with paclitaxel and short retention compared to long retention with paclitaxel. So if you look at the last two features, it seems to be the drawback of serolimus. And that's maybe the reason why we have not seen until now the technology uh, converting like they did very fast in the stent era from paclitaxel to serolimus. Because in order to turn those two red in the serolimus to green, you have to have a unique technology. Again, paclitaxel is absorbed quickly and tends to localize in the subintimal space and partition significantly in the adventitia. Sirolimus, however, absorbs slowly and spread throughout the entire artery where it dilutes down to subtherapeutic level. So again, uh, looking on both of them, there are definitely uh, challenges with Sirolimus. Uh, it is a cytostatic drug, it is safer, it offers unique anti-inflammatory, uh, but there are the challenges. And what are the challenges? The challenges that overcame by, or need to be overcome by serolimus is to enhance the tissue absorption to facilitate serolimus enter into the arterial wall, extend the serolimus tissue retention, which is uh, less lipophilic compared to paclitaxel. So you'll cover the entire restenosis cascade and also develop a new, more durable and washout resistant coating. So these are the main features that needs to be overcome if one wants to use a serolimus eluting balloon. So this is uh, being resolved by the proprietary technology of the solution SLR, which is a Medalliance product. Uh, and what this technology offers you, it offers you a proprietary micro reservoir technology which creating micro reservoirs that combining serolimus and biodegradable polymer. Then you have the miniature drug delivery system, which is optimal size micro reservoirs to achieve pharmacokinetic release profile, uh, comparable to the best in class PES and consistent and uh, predictable drug release that sustain therapeutic effect up to 90 days. And that should be sufficient to abolish stenosis. And the, th the third component, which is very unique, is what is called CAT, cell adherent technology, which is a proprietary amphipathic lipid technology, which binds the micro reservoirs to the balloon surface. And this is contains the, and, and protects the micro reservoirs during insertion and inflation. It enhances drug retention and the bioavailability allowing for a lower drug dose concentration of the balloon surface and optimize the transfer of the micro reservoirs to the tissue and maximizes the cellular uptake of serolimus. So again, uh, just maybe more in details, this is the micro reservoirs, they are precision engineered drug delivery system made of biodegradable polymer intermixed with serolimus drug. Then you have the mechanical uh, as the balloon expands in one way, the biological highly lipophilic cat coating binds to the fatty cells in the vessel wall. And then you have the third component, which is the electrostatic. Uh, these are basically the three mechanical ways in which uh, you overcome the drawback of serolimus and make it effective. The manic mechanical gives you the balloon compliance to ensure optimal acquisition of the cat coating to the vessel wall. The electrostatic is uh, leading to the cat coating that is attracted to the vessel through the ionic interaction. And finally, the biological, which is a highly lipophilic cat, 
coating that binds to the fatty cells and optimizing the microreservoirs to transfer into the vessel wall. These are some uh, information that was done by Renover Money that shows very nicely the pharmacokinetics and the drug dose per balloon size and also the arterial tissue drug concentration when you're looking here on the serolimus versus the competitors. So for example, if you look here on the orange, the, serol the serolimus, uh, you see here that in one hour, the tissue drug concentration in microgram uh, would be 262. And this is much higher than what you would see compared to the paclitaxel, but to other competitors. And this is true all the way up to 60 days. And this is the uh, electron microscopy that shown very nicely uh, how this is a interface uh, within 24 hours into the adventitia and the vessel wall. These are showing us uh, again the concentration in the arterial uh, surface. And when you compare the solution here in the green to the Zions, which is a drug loading stand, which we all know, it's very similar. If you take and compare it to the medic charge, which is another uh, drug eluting balloon with serolimus, uh, you see the superiority of the solution SLR over the magic touch. So what you're seeing here that overall, if we look at this, we see that the solution SLR tissue concentration is very similar to what we're seeing with drug eluting stent. And here, uh, again, the drug transfer, comparing the Medellin solution to the Paclitaxel uh, and to the Bibard and Metronic, the Lutronics and the Impact. Uh, and this is a very important information. As you know, when you deliver the balloon to the target, you have a loss of material during the procedure, during the transfer to the target area. You can see here, the transfer here in the red is the smaller with the solution compared to the paclitaxel. Uh, more retained on the balloon and more transfer to the vessel. So in essence, we can claim here the efficacy of the solution would be superior to the one in the PTX balloon, at least by the delivery system, we have all this information. So the sustained release really does matter. We do need a longer elution uh, than a short elution in order to overcome the entire cascade of the restenosis because it takes time to uh, complete the restenosis process. So the longer elution, the better. And uh, there are some examples with what happens if you don't have it. And these are being taken from the drug eluting stand era. So for example, um, Endeavor was inferior to Cypher and Zions because again, the elution profile was different. If you look at the periphery, there was a difference between slower elution and fast elution with serolimus. Uh, and you saw that this was impacting on the late loss. When you have a slower elution, it's 0.39. When you have a fast elution, it's 0.72 late loss. So obviously you'd like to see more slower elution and that's what the sustained release offered. So the higher percentage of drug crystals in coating is associated with the higher tissue concentration through 90 days in the porcelain arterial model Again, the work that was done uh, in Renover Money Lab. And in the most efficacious paclitaxel DCB for the SFA, there is long term presence of drug tissue, drug and tissue through the 90 days. Uh, another important aspect of drug looting balloon, the drug coated balloon, is the integrity of the coating. Uh, we see flakes coming out from different balloons. You can see them very um, easily if you do those in vitro. This can happen even when you just inflate the balloon. But for the lutonics, but uh, for the, uh, the solution balloon, uh, you don't see it. So you can see the coating here on company A on the top and company B, but with solution uh, SLR, we don't see any flaking. And finally, uh, one word about the micro reservoir technology, uh, which called also microspheres. They have been extensively used also in other, other pharma industries, so it's not something new. And it's um, 
uh, solve uh, manufacturing problems that create extended release purpose and reduce toxicities, otherwise uh, rapidly absorbed drugs. It is a very accepted technology and unlike nanoparticles, microspheres can be precisely manufactured to an exact and repeatable particle size and elution profile, which give you more uniform and predictable outcome. Uh, and it is a very uh, known and effective technology to deliver drug therapies. From here, I'd like just to mention that there is a very robust uh, coronary trial program within the solution. Uh, started with the, the first in men, going to the ISR IDE for instant tristenosis. Uh, this is going to be a pivotal study for the U.S. to get approval of 418 patients. Study that already launched in Europe, and we're waiting in the U.S. to start it as well. Then you have the, the, the solution, the Novo, which is the mega study in our field, 3,326 patients that's going to be in Asia and Europe. And then uh, the solution, uh, the Novo IDE in the U.S., which is currently under review. So a very robust program uh, to support the data for the use of this um, solution product. Finally, I'd like to just uh, go over the study of the de novo uh, study design. Uh, this is, I think, a very attractive, I think, beyond instant tristenosis. We claim that every place that you put a stent, you potentially can treat that also with drug eluting balloon. So you have to screen the patients, you see if the patients are candidate, and then the randomization would be all DEB strategy versus all DES strategy. On the DEB treatment, it would be according to the hospital practice, including adequate vessel preparation. And again, for the DES treatment, it's going to be also according to hospital practice. So this one-to-one -one randomization of 3,326 number of sites would be really uh, the first and the large one in this field. Uh, the PI uh, of the solution, the novel study, are Simon Eckerstell and Christian Spalding uh, from the UK and France. The objective would be to demonstrate non-inferiority for TVF of a treatment strategy with the solution SLR plus provisional DS versus systematic treatment with DS for the treatment of the novel lesions. Uh, the design is prospective randomized clinical trials, open label comparing the solution DEB to DES. I talked about the number of patients, number of sites. The primary endpoint is TVF, cardiac death, target vessel related MI at one year, and the patients will be followed all the way up to five years, and TVF uh, at five years would be also a co primary endpoint. And then you have all the traditional secondary endpoint at two years, three years, and four years and follow-up goes all the way up to five years. So this is really a pivotal study that can change the field because if we do find, and this is the study question, the hypothesis, that indeed the solution would be non-inferior to stents, I think that can bring us back to the balloon and re revolutionize the way that we perform intervention. So to summary and the take-up message, I think we do recognize now that DEB offers the lead nothing behind concept. Preservation of physiological motion and overcome problems associated with the use of permanent metallic stents. Sirolimus is the preferred drug for DEB technology. The main challenges are tissue absorbance and drug retention. But the solution SLR offers sustained release via proprietary microreservoirs and cell adherent technology. And the success of this technology in the theme and the confidence of the sponsor on the product led to the design of a mega pivotal trial for ISR and the low lesions. And I'd like to thank you for uh, the opportunity and looking forward to see the results of those clinical trials in a few years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. This was outstanding. I think we all learned so much and, uh, and this promising technology can really expand the indication for DCB. So we'll save the discussion for later. And I'm, 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 I would like to invite uh, um, Anibal to present the next speaker. I'm sure that Ricardo is already there, ready for his 10 minute talk. <laughs> uh, Anibal. Sure, thanks Alex. Thanks Alex so much. Uh, and I will introduce uh, my good friend and uh, uh, the president of the Brazilian Society of Interventional Cardiology, 
a very active member of SOLASI, a very active clinical investigator, Dr. Ricardo Costa, who will present us the solution, sustained line of release clinical data overview. Thank you, Ricardo, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Anibal, for the kind words, and thank you, Alex. It's great to be here, and after this great talk from Ron giving what's, what's why we should consider this new technology as something really to improve the outcomes. I'm going to bring the results of the first in men trial, the Cerellumus, of the solution Cerellumus drug eluding balloon. So the objective of this study was to assess the safety and efficacy as a first in men uh, study of this device. And it did include the novel and instant stenosis lesions in vessels 2.0 to 3.0 millimeters in diameter and lesion length less than equal to 18 millimeters. This uh, trial considered at least 50 patients in six clinical uh, sites in Asia. And the prime endpoint was freedom from device and procedure related mortality at 30 days. And then all of the common angiographic and clinical parameters at six and 12 months. Just the trial oversight. We have here, uh, uh, Stefan Winneker was the chairman, uh, along with Don Cutlip and Robert Byrne, all known in, in this field. And we had the core lab, the graphic core lab at the CRC in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Overall, there were 56 patients, one patient and one lesion included. There was one case, there was a bailout stenting in a side branch that was predilated, it was stent implanted, in the main vessel ended up receiving stem, so we did not include in the in the in the, in the main uh, results. Overall, there are 55 considered for geographic analysis, and the 30-day clinical outcome was completed in all the cases for the primary endpoint and the six-month follow-up in 44 cases. The enrollment was between 2018 and 2019. And here you can see a summary of the key clinical out, uh, profile of these patients. 50% diabetics. This is like a, a, what we see in some countries in Asia. Smoking, 27%. Previous MI, 14%. And previous PCI, 29%. In terms of pre-procedure QCA, the mean lesion length was 11 millimeters. The reference vessel diameter, 2.21 and the percent of stenosis around 68%. At post-procedure, we can see an acute gain of 1.07 and a balloon after ratio around 1.1, which we consider to be an optimal outcome for these balloon uh, angioplasty cases. Out of hospital clinical events, we did not have any events up to one month. So the primary endpoint, which was freedom from the vast and procedure rate mortality through 30 days, we could consider 100%. And at six months, there was one target lesion revascularization that was, we're gonna also show this case. In terms of the technique, balloon predilatation as recommended by the protocol was performed 82%. The, the, the study drug coated balloon was performed in all the cases. An additional balloon was used in two cases, 4%, and bailout stand implantation was uh, done in one case. Here we can see the community distribution CFD curves for MLD. And in the far left side, pre procedure 0.71, at post 1.79, at follow up 1.53. Here the community distribution curve for percent diameter stenosis. We can see here the pre procedure and then at post and follow up, we don't see a major difference between this important parameter for this type of device. And here the community distribution curve for late loma loss. Most of them we can see a more narrow distribution to the left side and a few outliers, as you can see uh, plotted in this graph. The mean values at six month QCA, the percent diameter stenosis was 30.5% and the late loan loss was 0.26%. Of course, this parameter is, uh, was performed in those with pair angiographic analysis. 
I bring you a few examples. Perhaps this is the most uh, considered uh, 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 criteria for DCB to date, which is instant restenosis. So we can see here in the prox LED, a very severe subocclusive lesion at pre-procedure. Then after dilatation with two drug-coated balloons, solution drug-coated balloons, we can see the follow-up, just a steady, perfect result from post to six months. Another example, a very similar lesion, also subocclusive ISR in the proximal LED, and a post-procedure and follow-up, a great, well-sustained result. Here we can see another well-represented type of lesion in this study, which was small vessels, and a more distal circumflex at pre-procedure, very severe stenosis at post-procedure, and then a follow-up, just a great result as well appreciated in these uh, illustrations. Another uh, important subset that's being more and more considered for drug-coated balloons, a side branch bifurcation side branch, you can actually simplify procedures with this type of device. And at pre-procedure, you see osteostenosis. At post-procedure, you have to have a stent in the main vessel. And here, at follow-up, a great, well-sustained results. And here, I bring you the only uh, uh, major adverse clinical event reported. This was a subocclusive ISR to begin with. And importantly, this patient, which was not uh, uh, procedure was not done as recommended by the protocol, you first have a paclitaxel DCB to predilate this lesion. Then following, it did have the study device, and this was a post-procedure result. And this patient came back with a very severe stenosis, and it was the highest late lumen loss, 2.14, and this patient underwent TLR with a regular metallic stent. So with that, I would like to conclude for this 10-minute presentation that the solution serum saline balloon with a sustained release demonstrated favorable clinical and geographic follow-up results, and these results have supported the CMARC submission and approval of this device. Thank you for your attention. Ricardo, I'm uh, listen. This was great, and and again, it's good to see that this new technology is not only a theory. There is uh, some clinical results, and uh, we are very excited to see how it's going to evolve with our largest trials. So um, the, uh, our last spe speaker is uh, Florian Kukuli. He's from Switzerland, and we have to really recognize his efforts. It's already tomorrow in Switzerland, so it's 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. So thank you so much, Florian, for joining us and to contribute to Solasi. Uh, the word is yours. I'm sure that you're going to put some pepper in this uh, presentation in terms of uh, how we can uh, push this technology in clinical practice. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for your uh, very kind introduction and the possibility to speak uh, to you. I'm here with my son who is 10 and didn't want to go to bed. We are actually on holiday, so that's why I could afford to stay up this long. Um, so what I would like to speak, I would like to go more into technical details because we have been using the solution balloon extensively in my lab. We have probably used more than 400 balloons so far and most of them in, in native lesions. Um, so um, I would like to speak more how to prepare lesions and I will show you some clinical examples and uh, I'm very excited to have then maybe some discussions. I mean, to start with, we, we all know the career of our patients. They start with stents, they go for bypass and they come back for stents and they receive balloons and then they receive more stents and then we put the coronary sinus reducer because we have nothing better to do with them. And we have, uh, as uh, Ron also showed, we have um, the problem of stent thrombosis. This is rare, but if it happens like this in this patient, then it's quite detrimental for the patient because this patient is now in heart failure. And we have also this problem that um, the vasoconstriction, which we see from time to time, this was a patient who was extensively extended in the past, and I was able to catch this severe vasoconstriction, as you can see very distally in the LED, which could be corrected with repetitive doses of nitroglycerin. 
Now, if you look why um, stents fail, then we know we have some factors, diabetes, CTO, ISR, long lesions and small diameter. And I think this is exactly the situation where we should be thinking about using drug balloons because we know stents do perform badly in this kind of situations. And this is maybe, um, um, let's say, the ground for my talk, because I try to use drug routine balloons, especially solution, exactly in this kind of situation. And I do not make exceptions in calcified lesions, because I think in calcified lesions, we know even better than, than stents perform badly. So if we can replace stents with balloons in such situations, why not? Let's do it. And um, I, this is a case which was not treated with a balloon, but which made me discover a new way of preparing lesions. This was a calcified lesion, and I said, why, why don't we just cut and crack it? So why don't I use first a cutting balloon? I use usually Wolverine to cut the calcium, and then I use an opium and C balloon to crack uh, the calcium and create lumen. I used this many, many times for a... Uh, uh, lesion preparation in cuts by lesions, and then I discovered that actually this is a good way to even treat normal lesions if I want to treat the lesion with a drug eluting balloon. So all the cases I will present are cut and crack and then uh, solution cases. Um, now, you will have the situation of a patient who is 38 years old uh, with familiar dyslipidemia, and I think putting a stent in this patient is just the start of, of his end, because this is, we know they will look great in the beginning and they will start, he will start to have um, late lumen loss, maybe because because he this is a high risk patient, but in this case, it's actually a bifurcation. So I, um, I put this case on LinkedIn and then most of my colleagues suggested to use two stents, in fact, in, in this kind of patient. So use two stents for a bifurcation in a 30 years old man. Um, well, um, I think it's wise, and this is what we have done so far, but it, since um, in the introduction of solution and some really early encouraging results, I said, well, I'm going to try uh, to avoid it. So um, in this case, I use a Wolverine balloon for that lesion, uh, especially in the main branch. I use a smaller balloon for the side branch. Then um, BU, I use a 3O balloon to create some lumen, um, OPNNC, uh, it's a high pressure balloon, but I use it at, at lower pressure because you, I, I don't want to completely dissect the vessel, but really just expand the lesion and gain some lumen. Then I did some casing uh, balloon inflation before I used uh, the solution balloon, and then I used the solution balloon. And I will uh, re angio this patient in the, uh, in the future. Uh, but you can see this is what the result looked like. And I left it like this. And this is now about uh, four months over and the patient has not come back and he hasn't, have, he hasn't had a stem thrombosis. Of course, angiographically it would look better if you do it uh, with two stents in, in the initial phase, but the patient is symptom free and he's 38 and it's, he, we still have enough time for this patient to put uh, some stents there. Now, I also showed uh, you that in CTO, stents perform badly. So um, I had a patient with a CTO, he's 60 years old, he has diabetes, and uh, his, his uh, CTO is in the circumflex. As you can see here, the circumflex is not a big vessel, it's long disease, and um, you could, of course, put uh, two, two long stents here and cover it up nicely. But you know, this is a diabetic patient, and he will probably have some... some uh, most likely some problems in the future and because his diabetes will also not become better than rather worse. So in this case, again, I use a Wolverine balloon, I use an OPNC balloon, and then I use two uh, solution balloons, 40 and 30 millimeters long. Um, and this is what it looked like initially. Now you would say, well, you know, initially it looks good, but in six months you will have late lumen loss like crazy and you would have been much better to understand. Well, I brought the patient back after six months just to also have some, some feedback for myself and for the patient. I told him that I'm using this now in a rather experimental way. We don't have big data to support this, but I, I said to him that I have a lot of data to support that long stents in diabetic patients do not perform well. And look what it looks like after six months. It looks uh, very nice. The patient hasn't had any restenosis actually, and he's doing very well. And in fact, if you compare the, um, the angios immediately post-procedure and after six months, in fact, it actually looks better. The um, uh, circumflex is wider. It has 
that have these positive modelings. So this encouragement, this case is now maybe about uh, seven, eight months old uh, since the re-angio, and this encouraged me to even push this uh, further. Now, we did um, a lot of uh, patients. This is just uh, the summary of the abstract we just submitted for TCT, 61 patient, uh, vast majority. We, we usually do intimal recognition in Lucerne. We don't like the subintimal tracking. If possible, we can we try to avoid that. Most are treated with DS and DB, but 20 patients of these are actually only with DB, like in this patient. And uh, we have only a 208 days mean follow-up, but um, the target lesion failure rate is extremely good, 5.2% for this uh, population. So I hope we, this uh, abstract gets accepted TCT so we can share also there our experience. And the mechanism was actually in one patient, a non-healed dissection. I, this is a patient I treated. I had a dissection which I left behind and then the patient came back after four months and had to put a stent because the dissection did not heal. And in only two patients we had true ISR or, or let's say not instant because it was in a native vessel, but it, uh, just in uh, in segments the nose if we go. Now let's speak about some bifurcations. And bifurcations in the, in the meaning that not fit in the side branch, but bifurcation really considering the main branch or um, trying to avoid um, stents in in um, in bifurcating lesions. This is a patient who has had a lot with his heart. This is a pericardial. Um, he had um, constrictive pericarditis, and you can see this very nasty bifurcation lesion in the in the circumflex uh, with the intermediate branch. I think if you try to stand here, you will end up putting three stents, and it will be difficult to solve this. You might get it to look good graphically in the beginning, but this is a um, bad because I mean the patient has severe coronary disease because of he had he was uh, he had radiation when he was a very young man with Hodgkin lymphoma. And he has had peri uh, pericardectomy, and he has had tabby, and he has a pacemaker. So really, this is not the patient you want to to, to play with uh, three different stents. So I actually treated him um, just with balloons, um, with two um, solution balloons, and this is the result after four months. And I think it it looks good. It doesn't look perfect. Uh, but the patient doesn't have any symptoms. He will receive soon a CRT system because he has he's being continuously paced. But actually, his angina disappeared completely. And I think this ca cases like this somehow encourage me to to go further. Now, another difficult bifurcation. This is a case I treated last week. Um, you have uh, and and this was a patient who was a very close relative of a of a co-worker of ours. So it was really uh, I wanted to do my best to uh, for this patient. But I have this really uh, bad lesion there, uh, calcified. I have OCT, which I'm not showing here. And these two um, big side branches. Now, how can I do this case just to put a stent in and then save also these side branches? It's not that easy. You um, you will surely appreciate that. Now, I predilated again, cutting balloon. Then I used a 3 or open balloon. And look what happened. Um, the, uh, the side branches shut down. Now, I gained the side branches. I put a small balloon in both side branches quickly because I had wired them, luckily, and, and I could establish flow in the side branches. But I said, I'm not putting a stent here. This is going to, to cause me a lot of trouble. So I said, why not use a, just a drug eating balloon? And I use a drug eating balloon, and this is what it looked at the end. I have nice luminal gain. The side branches are flowing. The patient is doing well. And um, I think in such a case, it's perfectly legitimate to, to try to, to do this. But unfortunately, we don't have data to support this. So I'm taking the risk, let's say, on my on my shoulders. But I had to do it because this was the best, best I could offer to the patient. Now, and the last case I would like to share with you is a hybrid hybrid case. So this is a 69-year-old lady. She has severe LED disease and severe RCA disease, as you will see. She did not want open cabbage. So we offered her minimal, uh, minimal invasive cabbage, Lima to LED. And said, let's do the RCA. Now, I would like to share uh, with the RCA. The LED was uh, was crafted uh, six weeks ago. Now, here you can see there is a, a tight lesion in the mid part, and but also a very bad diffuse disease in the top part. And when you put a six French guide catheter there, it damped. So I had to treat that part as well. So what did we do here? Well, um, again, cutting it with a two five balloon. Then. OPM balloon uh, in the top part 3.0, in the distal part 2.5. And then I said, for the proximal part, the lesion was collapsing over and over. So I said, there in the osteal part, I will put a stent. 
uh, because I want to have the ostium open because it was collapsing if the catheter was damping continuously. And for the distal part, I'll just use a balloon. And this is what I did. So the, pr the proximal part has a, a drug eluting stent and the distal part, I used the four, 40 millimeters, 2.5 solution balloon. The important thing, maybe the last thing I would like to mention is um, what I have learned so far with this uh, uh, cases I have done is to rather undersize. So if I use a 3 O balloon uh, OPM for lumen gain, for luminal gain, I, I use a 2.5 solution balloon at very low pressure to just deliver the, the drug and, and try to seal those minor dissection you might have. Because I think if you use it's a, it's a semi compliant balloon. If you use a tubular balloon, then you dissect them, then you will need a stent because you dissected with the balloon. So, this is maybe a tip I can give to the um, uh, people who are uh, listening. Now, um, my take home message is I think with careful lesion preparation, and we are not there at the end. I think this is the key before we, we, try, we uh, establish these balloons even more in our clinical practice. We have to uh, learn how to prepare lesions well. I think we are not there yet. Um, my way cut and crack could be the way to go but i don't also not i don't have data for this but it looks promising so far and i think what i can say is solution performs extremely well because the patients who come back they have good results and this gives me the hope that we can continue this way and we don't get any disappointment hopefully in the future thank you very much for listening i hope i kept the time and um, let's have a nice discussion to, ke to keep me awake <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Flori. This was uh, outstanding and, and real world cases, right? We are not talking about focal instant stenosis or only side branches. I think this was very educative for all of us. Uh, so Flori, Ron and, and Ricardo, we do have three excellent panelists that is gonna, I'm sure, bombard you with some questions. Uh, Anibio da Monte, I already present, introduced. We have um, Marco Weinstein and Gaston Dussaila. So three very experienced interventionalists, I will give the word to them for questions, but just a quick question to Flory. Um, this is, this is a, already a, a good registry, right? With 400 patients, almost 500 balloons. Uh, how much late follow-up consistently do you have? And, and, and if you have some angiographic follow-up, this is already a paper because this is new technology. Yeah, well, we are, we also submitted the second abstract um, where we have a follow-up of, of about nine months for all comers and um, about one third of our patients have had angiographic follow-up and we are now summarizing all this data and um, well I will gladly suggest you as a reviewer if you don't mind <laughs> um, but but I think we should really uh, we should really get out this data because um, um, it's not only me in the lab, but we, I have two outstanding interventional cardiologists working under me who just believe in this. And I, um, the, the only problem we have is that that financially, actually, if the patient are staying overnight, then then we are doing backwards. So in Switzerland, you are getting punished because you use drugs and balloons. So I have to to withhold them and say, well, don't don't overdo it before the hospital administration notices this. But otherwise, it's um, you know patients are coming back, they're doing well, and this encourages you to use it more and more. But we will put this data out very quickly. Wonderful. This reminds me, Ron, reminds me of my fellowship with Gus Pichar that always said that better than any stent is no stent. <laughs> So that will be interesting to see uh, this new technology now with a different concept with lesion preparation that we didn't have so much before. So, uh, Anibo, do you want to start with the first question? Yes, for sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, I, I just want to congratulate the, all the three speakers and Men Alliance for, 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 for organizing this uh, symposium because actually, I think that there is an uh, with the available technology, there is an underuse of drug coated balloon in regular practice, and I think that uh, we will all agree, whether in Europe, the United States, Latin America, and maybe Asia, there is an underuse because the available technology uh, does not. Uh, the, I think does not have the results. We uh, have not shown the results that we would like to see in our daily practice. This is completely uh, out of the box because uh, Ron clearly showed us uh, the innovative technology that is behind this uh, uh, slow release uh, sirolimus 
and uh, then uh, Ricardo clearly showed us the is a amazing late loss, very low late loss for me uh, in, in this uh, first in man and the, the, the cases that were presented by, by Dr. Kukuli were uh, real world practice and um, very, very, very uh, complex cases, most, most of them. So I, I would like to hear from you, how do you foresee the future of drug coaching balloons with this technology, with this new technology? Ron? Uh, maybe I will start and, and I will tell you that uh, it's a question of uh, believing and starting to do it because the stent is very gratifying. You get a very good result. Some people even don't do vessel preparation, but we do pay a tax for that. Um, I think that uh, we have to start where the stents are not doing that good. So when you go to the small vessel, to the distal vessel, there is not even a question. I mean, we don't want to put stents in those areas. Then uh, you have a side branch of bifurcation. So I think you don't start from the proximal LAD, uh, the 3-5 vessel, although I think that Florin does all of them. And I think you're going to get there if you're going to get after 400 cases. But how do you start? You start with those areas that you know that stents are not doing well. And I think we do have data today on small vessel and we have, uh, it's very intuitive that you can sometimes massage the distal vessel with balloon, but you want a drug coated balloon and the same for the bifurcation. Uh, so these areas, I think there is no question. Uh, you can go to other areas like diabetes. Uh, if you ask me the future in my perspective is to go after the non-culprit lesion. Uh, and uh, I will tell you one statement that I've been uh, getting more and more um, fun of uh, after the LRP study and the Prospect 2 study. Patients don't die from ischemia, but they die from rupture plaque. And those lesions that we would identify them, and now we have tools to identify as a vulnerable plaque, they're not obstructive lesions. So you don't really want to treat them with a stent, but if you want to passivate it, drug eluting balloon could be a great application. And this is a whole new era, and you ask me about future. So my vision is that if we'll ever treat a vulnerable plaque, that would be, would be the way to treat that, not necessarily a metallic stent. So uh, it is a question of choice. If you want to get a very good result, no dissections, immediately larger a, uh, acute gain, yeah, you can put the stent there, but there is a tax to pay. And I see those taxes because they still send me patients for brachytherapy and those patients with three, four, five layers of stent. I see patients that they started with the proximal LAD, but they went all the way to the distal, almost to the apex. I mean, you, why do you do it? So in the US, we don't have drug coated balloon for the coronary. And that's probably one of the reasons, but if you do have it, then you don't go beyond the mid vessel with a stent, you go with a drug coated balloon. And my final comment, if you really want to see what happened in the periphery world, we completely moved from stents or POBA to drug coated balloon. They are dominating right now the SFA, the Argonne dominant also below the knee, which are small vessel. So uh, there is not much competition there, I understand, but still they are better than drug eluting stent. They are better than bare metal stent and they're better than POBA. So the same analogy you can apply to coronary, again, maybe not a hundred percent, but you have to start from somewhere. And I think one of the issues that bothered me all the years with drug coated balloon was the fact that I didn't want to put paclitaxel in patients' coronary arteries. And no matter what you're gonna tell me, it's a good and safe and it's effective. I didn't feel comfortable with paclitaxel in the coronary arteries because I've seen all the results with taxels and the aneurysm and the other toxicity. I think when you have a drug like Sirolimus, it's a game changer. And if you can apply it and you get a good result, then why not? So I would start with a drug DEB, like the solution SLR. If I have dissection, I will probably have to tackle that with a stent. My question to Florin, and I, I talked too much already, so I'm gonna pass the question. What is your experience with those that you did the solution and then you still were not satisfied with the result, whether it's a recoil or dissection and you added a stand, because then you have like two drug 
combination devices, drug eluting balloon and drug eluting stand? Um, well, maybe uh, before I answer your question, Ron, first my comment, how I personally see the future. I'm of course younger than um, you and less experienced. In a way, I, I think I believe in a complete metal-free future, and um, I think in the maybe in about 15 years we will be using approximately a scaffold and this study a balloon, a drug eluting balloon. I think this should be our end vision for treating coronaries. I think putting metal in coronaries, um, um, I think I think this is not good for the future because. However, I mean, I pay a lot of attention to lesion preparation, to luminal gain. I use in almost all my cases intravascular imaging. I really do it with love. And sometimes when you see the patient coming back to three, four, five years, you still see a lot of uh, luminal loss um, because this never stops. And uh, and this is I, that's why I think we should go away from that. Now, regarding the technical bit, how 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 I solve that issue, it's it's always difficult. That's why I try to to really decide um, if I should ever start with a drug in balloon or just say, okay, well, this is this needs a stent. And for this, I think lesion preparation is the key. And, and this is really the, the focus for me for the next maybe 12 months to learn how to prepare a lesion. And maybe the trial, which is planned by, um, by um, MedAlliance, maybe it's a bit too early for that trial because if the trial fails against stents, then it might fail because we have not understood how to prepare the lesion well, not because the balloon is not good. At the end, it will be a solution did not perform well. If it didn't, I hope it will. We will participate. But I think uh, understanding how to pre prepare the lesion well. Now, there are cases where I've used, if I dissect with a drug balloon, that I, I use then a, another balloon for prolonged inflation, and then I put a second uh, drug balloon on it. So I try to avoid this combination of, of one uh, drug um, from the balloon with then another drug from, from a Zion stem. But sometimes it's just not possible and then I have to put another stem over it. It's not ideal, but I think we have to, we have to speak much more about how to prepare these lesions well for drug balloons and when is, when is enough luminal gain achieved? Because very often that's the problem that you try if you if you uh, if you want to achieve stent like results then you will dissect a lot so you should be able to accept a little bit of of uh, less luminal gain acutely but of course enough luminal gain for the patient to have no more angina and to be to be happy and this is a difficult compromise and i haven't understood it yet i mean i i've used it hundred times hundreds of times but i still i'm still working on myself Thank you, for So, uh, Gaston, do you want to make some comments and, and, and questions, please? We, we, I think we only have like five minutes to finish, so you and... Uh, yes, uh, I, I have a... Uh, 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 well, thank you very much for inviting me in this uh, exciting uh, topic. Uh, I think one of the problems and, uh, that we will have uh, is that... Uh, People, are, especially young interventionists, are not doing any balloon angioplasty. They think that balloons are just for preparing uh, the, the way for the stent. So uh, we have to teach them how to do balloon preparation, uh, lesion preparation, dilatation, in order to have a, a good result and, and learn a lot about what is a good result with balloons and then to apply the technology. Uh, that is really, really exciting. Uh, I have a, a question, if there is uh, enough time, uh, about the mechanism that uh, this will uh, produce uh, uh, a better uh, uh, lumen loss, uh, less lumen loss. Is this inhibiting just the proliferation or is also affecting the negative remodeling that is uh, the main cause of restenosis after balloon dilatation. Is there any any studies on that? Yeah. So, so Ricardo, do you want to take this uh, question and, and respond quickly, please? Sure. I think both mechanisms are involved. And it's interesting to see in this first in my study, there are 56 lesions and only 12 were ISR. There are 44 lesions de novo. 
and the best results, geographic results, were seen in the de novo, meaning that you can achieve a, a higher acute gain with, uh, within the stent, but you also going to have a higher loss. So the late human loss was higher there. With balloon angioplasty, as we know, you might have less acute gain, but less loss. So the percentage of stenosis, the delta percentage of stenosis was actually smaller uh, in the de novo uh, group. And just to make a comment about the discussion, I think my generation has been born, you know, with stents. And I have to say that I'm becoming a believer as I'm seeing these results and we start to do more and more cases with DCB. And I think it's really uh, something that uh, fellows from now on, uh, physicians need to learn, like they learn how to do stenting for diffuse, distal, small vessels and side branches. Uh, yes, uh, I, it was a privilege to be here. Sorry that I was a little late. I was uh, uh, in another session and also uh, stuck in the card lab. So, Mike, uh, uh, actually, I think you have like two minutes. Uh, so, I have two or three comments. Uh, uh, for, uh, and I'll try to be very straight. Uh, first, uh, we've been using uh, drug eluding balloons for a long time. Uh, uh, we, we've been uh, involved with some studies, and uh, particularly every year involved in a session, but with packet tax eluding balloons with, uh, with paratronicus. Uh, you know, uh, one, because you're also involved with paratronicus as well. Uh, with their uh, Mac Marys and the dreams and all the, the, the sort of the, the, the bioabsorbable products. So we've been working together in this. Uh, I, I really believe in, in drug eluting balloons, regardless of paclitaxel. And I also uh, believe that uh, Cyrolimus is a much more appealing uh, drug, uh, despite the fact that we don't know exactly the, the kinetics of uh, Cyrolimus for DCB. Uh, I think uh, solution has a very particular one and 90 days can act very promising in, in, uh, in, uh, in lab, but we have to see uh, in, in patients how it, how it does. But my other comment is uh, regarding uh, lesion preparation it has been stressed here and we have a study uh, um, Robert Byrne and, uh, and others have uh, demonstrated in his uh, uh, desire that uh, lesion preparation with cutting balloon is very, very important for using, uh, uh, especially for instant stenosis. We've been using, and I use it today in a case that the patient arrived in a, a non STEMI today at the lab and he had a tight lesion proximal ID and a diffused lesion uh, distal ID. And at the end, uh, at the eye, it was a uh, um, uh, um, dissection, it was uh, uh, at the, what he had. So uh, it's spontaneous dissection, scat. So we were able to, to use a drug coating balloon. After we use the cutting balloon for the scat, we use drug coating balloon for the whole distal LAD today. This was today. I, unfortunately, I cannot show you the images. And then the patient came in for a QMI after. We opened the lesion and then at the, uh, put the stent as usually, and after post dilated the stent, no flow. So this is another uh, indication for uh, for drug abundance. A QMI, uh, uh, in, in South Korea has a very, very large experience uh, in a registry with a QMI. If we use drug coding balloons for a QMI standing, I don't it seems very, very uh, tricky, uh, uh, we can prevent no flow. So this is another indication of, uh, besides it's small vessel, diffuse lesions, instant restenosis. Bifurcation we use a lot for when we have instant uh, restenosis in bifurcation in order to prevent using a third or second layer of stent. Uh, this is a, a very, very solid indication for this. I think there's a lot of indications for this and uh, hopefully uh, the Sarolius platform with solution will be even better. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marco. The final comments is uh, from your side, uh, Ron, please. Well, this has been an exciting uh, symposium, uh, and we still learn. There is so much to learn on drug coated balloon, and especially on serolimus. But I'm impressed by the data that Ricardo showed. I think this is not like anecdotal. We used to know that, give me results of 20 cases, and I'll tell you how the 200 going to look, right, Alex? So you gave us 45, 50. 
I do uh, concur with you that the, the novo is more important than the instant restenosis because it will use less stents, it's going to have less instant restenosis. And also, Ooh. instant restenosis of drug eluting stent is not that trivial to treat. It's not that simple. The novo lesion is much more easier. And finally, I have to throw here imaging because I think imaging is always going to help us to verify that we don't, uh, that, that we prep the vessel properly. Just throwing a balloon and inflating two millimeter, two and a half on a four vessel, that's not vessel preparation. We really have to demonstrate that the vessel preparation was done. So we are in an era of an exciting technology. We have to gradually move it on uh, forward. One thing that I commend um, MedAlliance is that they are not shy of clinical trials. That for, for a startup company to throw 3,300 patient study, 500 patients in instant restenosis, that's huge, huge undertake. So I wish them that the study will be positive. I'm optimistic that they would from everything that I saw so far, but all remain to be seen. So continue the research and the follow up on those patients and thanks for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Solasi. Thank you, Med Alliance. Thank you, the speakers and the panelists. Have a great night and a good morning for you, Flori. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.